Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sheila Hollis. I'm the Acting Executive Director of the United States Energy Association. It is a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, and we are uh, together for a very exciting press roundtable uh, on the issues facing natural gas development in Asia. Today's webinar has been funded by the U.S. Agency for International Development and organized by the U.S. Asia Gas Partnership, or AGP. AGP is part of USEA's Energy Utility Partnership Program, also, also known as EUPP. It's a public-private partnership between government and industry uh, representatives to optimize the development of secure, reliable, <clears throat> and economic sources of natural gas through, across the Indo-Pacific. The partnership is designed to both highlight technical topics for regulators, utilities, and policymakers across the region, and to foster business development and networking. <clears throat> AGP facilitates a shared understanding between government officials and the private sector about the technical, commercial, and economic factors that spur investment. To this end, as part of an ongoing webinar series uh, on the innovative development of LNG markets uh, in South and Southeast Asia, AGP is conducting this webinar on the issues facing natural gas development in Asia from the perspectives of the media covering those issues, obviously sensitive and timely. I'd like to thank our speakers for carving out time in their uh, tight schedules to share your uh, unique perspectives with us today. The panelists are some of the real experts on the ground. Uh, day in, day out, the media provide us with perspectives and outlooks on the issues, not just the lens of customers policymakers, regulators, or the industry, but basically everyone who is affected by uh, the issues. We hear from all of them, and so do these journalists. They offer a unique combined perspective and wisdom, and we welcome and look forward to hearing their uh, specific views uh, today. I would also like to thank Tanvi Madhusadhanan from the U.S. Trade and Development Agency for offering to host this webinar. Thank you so much, Tanvi. Uh, and uh, delighted to be with you today. She is the country manager for the Indo-Pacific region at the U.S. Trade Development Agency. She is responsible for business development, project preparation, management, and supervision of U.S. TDA activities in the region with a focus on energy, water, and environmental sectors, uh, and thus brings the perfect perspective to, today, to today's webinar. Uh, I'd like to mention that the United States Energy Association is a non-lobbying, non-partisan uh, organization which works closely with USAID State Department uh, and uh, the Department of Energy. And we also convene uh, uh, basically players from the energy field and, and those are impacted by energy issues uh, in the US for uh, programs and the like, uh, all open and free to the public and all who can watch them. In closing, please note that the views and opinions expressed in this webinar today are those of the presenters themselves and don't necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any other agency, organization, employer, or company. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm gonna give the floor now to Tanvi to introduce our first speaker and take it from here. Thank you, Tanvi. Thank you, Sheila, for your great remarks and uh, your kind introduction. Um, so as Sheila mentioned, I will be um, introducing our first panelist um, for today, Amanda Battersby, who is the Asia Bureau Chief at Upstream. So Amanda has uh, been the Asia Bureau Chief at Upstream for 19 years. It's a global oil and gas publication, and she joined the company as a Singapore-based correspondent uh, four years prior to becoming the Bureau Chief. Uh, in 1992, she completed her journalism training in London and joined an industry publisher, Nor Oil, that same year and initially covered the North Sea market. Uh, she has also worked for Heart Energy in the UK, where she launched the weekly Asia Petroleum News as managing editor. Um, outside of work, Amanda loves travel, yoga, coastal walking, and good vegetarian food. So Amanda, um, I'll kick it over to you to uh, kick us off with, with the remarks for today. Man, I think you're on mute. Thank you very much, Tanvi, for your kind introduction. And a good morning, good afternoon, good evening to the people, the delegates, attendees to this webinar. 
and thank you so much to the hosts for um, kindly inviting me to speak today. Going to start with a brief overview of the Asian gas market, and then I will look a little bit at a few specific countries within Southeast Asia, given the wealth of expertise and the topics that my esteemed panelists will also be talking on. Gas is a very interesting one for the Asian region. Not only is it one of the largest gas producing regions worldwide, it is also one of the largest customers. We are perhaps unique that we have nations that not only export gas, but at the same time also import. And there is certainly a huge scope for more gas developments across the region, although like gas globally, there are obstacles to be overcome and these are the main challenges today. Geopolitics is obviously huge, and I know this will be touched on by subsequent panelists. These issues can be because gas is transacted cross borders. We have technology um, challenges. Getting gas to market requires very long pipelines or other infrastructure. This is costly and technolog technologically challenging or as liquefied natural gas. The technologies have evolved, they are there, but to underpin a gas development, especially one that's coming what we call grassroots from the roots up, this requires financing and getting that financing is often dependent on having one or maybe several long-term customers for that gas or LNG. That financing can only be put in place once the so-called foundation customers are lined up. And this is getting increasingly tricky. Customers do not want to commit to such longer contracts in a lot of cases. Plus you have the funding issues where gas and LNG is perhaps no longer seen as green enough for certain financiers. Increasingly, European banks are shying away from financing, putting their weight behind gas developments in Asia, preferring to go down renewables as for their own green credentials. Indonesia is particularly interesting. It's home to what is still believed to be the largest unexploited gas reserve in Southeast Asia. The Firstly, it was known as Natuna D Alpha. It's now East Natuna, and Exxon, now ExxonMobil, discovered it more than 50 years ago. Yet today, the estimated 200 plus trillion cubic feet of gas on the, below the seabed still remains unexploited. It it's nowhere near existing on infrastructure, plus the gas is very sour. That means a high CO2 content or other so-called contaminants such as hydrogen sulfide, which not only means it's more challenging and more expensive to develop because you need certain materials that are less, that can resist the corrosion caused, it becomes less green. And this too is an issue today for fields discoveries made of Malaysia and in Vietnamese waters where even with the technology, the parent companies, the partners have concerns about their green credentials if they produce it. Local legislation might allow them to vent and flare, but their shareholders and non-governmental organizations probably aren't so keen on that. Also, we have an issue within Indonesia itself that some of the larger Western companies are looking to pull away those with deep pockets such as Chevron and Shell have both signaled their intent to pull out of gas developments there. Either they're not seeing the returns or the green credentials again are coming to play. Another issue that faces um, projects both in Indonesia and to a lesser extent Thailand is what's been dubbed resource nationalism. So a simple case where either the national oil company takes over the resources, projects, acreage that was historically, historically held by these companies, or when certain expiry dates of contracts come up, they jump in. 
this too is going to be more of an issue going forwards. So more reserves could be left in the ground. Then say, if you go to a place like Thailand, it is gas hungry. It, its own national production is in decline. Indigenous resources are dwindling. So for decades, it's now imported pipeline gas from Myanmar. Sounds good on paper, but Myanmar now, despite its terrible troubles, and the ongoing conflict, Myanmar now has burgeoning gas demand. There are four giant fields offshore, each with um, recoverable reserves well in excess of a trillion cubic feet. But yet, the lion's share of those four exploited fields flows by pipeline either to Thailand, or in the case of Posco Shui field, flows into another neighbor, China. So Myanmar finds itself in this awkward position of now needing to import liquefied natural gas simply to meet its own burgeoning power demand. Most of the gas used in Asia today is for power generation, but not necessarily so. More and more industries are switching to it where possible. More and more consumers prefer it if they can afford it. And affordability too is a big issue within some of the communities, especially within South and Southeast Asia. You find yourself in the chicken and egg situation whereby gas use actually has been shown to improve the quality of life, generate jobs, stimulate economies, but who is going to pay for that gas? And if the customers aren't lined up, who is going to finance the gas project to get it off the ground in the first place. Another potential issue is another interesting one for the region is unitization. Gas fields like oil fields do not respect international boundaries, be they onshore or in maritime waters. Thailand and Malaysia have a long-standing agreement for their so-called joint development area. That's great, that works for them. It took a while to thrash out, but the model works and is still working well today. Recently, we've seen unitization, but only of certain gas um, and also oil assets across the Malaysia-Brunei maritime border. Slowly, that will allow those fields to be exploited, and that's great. More feedstock gas can go to Brunei LNG plant, Malaysia, will also get some more gas. But there are still massive disputes in the South China Sea. It's only just recently the Philippines government reversed a several years long force majeure because of conflicts over China and the other, with and other claimants to certain parts that put the brakes on exploration and development of known gas assets. There's a huge swathe between Cambodia which with the exception of one very meager oil field that recently started up has no indigenous hydrocarbon production, but it's yet to agree it's overlapping claims area with neighbor Thailand. Those are issues that hopefully will and can be resolved going forwards. ASEAN itself has a long-standing plan for a trans-ASEAN as in the Association of Southeast Asian Nations a gas pipeline grid. I have seen that map for at least two decades. I'm not entirely sure when it was first drafted, but there are ambitious plans to link some already existing gas pipelines to have a grid that spans the 10 member nations, would allow gas to easily be transported between nations and then through smaller pipeline infrastructure to end users in sometimes more remote areas. Whether that will see the light of day, who knows? But at the same time, I think we can all take some encouragement from the advances in the transportation of liquefied natural gas, which increasingly now does not rely on huge ocean going tankers, but can be delivered by rail, by truck, only this week, Petronas from Malaysia sent some a cargo 
to a customer in China, Shanghai, using ISO tanks. Slowly, the world of Asia, or the region of Asia, is opening up to that gas distribution. And once more people want it, I think more development will follow. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Amanda, um, for your very insightful comments. I just want to take a moment now to remind um, everyone in the audience, we will be doing uh, questions at the end of all of the panelists' presentations. So feel free to drop questions in the chat. Uh, we will try to answer as many of those as we can once all of the panelists have had a chance to present. So with that, I'll move um, to our next panelist, Tim Dace, who's the founder of the APAC Energy Consultancy and an energy markets columnist for Asia Times Financial. Tim has been working in LNG and energy markets in the Asia Pacific region for more than 10 years uh, by being strategically based in the region in several countries, including Taiwan, the Philippines, and he is currently in Vietnam. Uh, he has performed risk analysis and consulting for US, UK, and Singapore-based energy consultancies, including Enerdata and KBR, as well as for key media outlets, such as S&P Global Platts, NASDAQ, Interfax Natural Gas Daily, Asia Times Financial, Forbes, um, among many others. He's also part of the Senior Advisory Network for the UK-based Critical Resource. Uh, so Tim has recently increased his focus on the growth of pricing benchmarks, investment in LNG and gas infrastructure in Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines, and Indonesia, the changing dynamics of LNG contracts, small scale and mid scale LNG development, and LNG to power in Southeast Asia. So with that, Tim, I will hand it over to you to start your presentation. Thank you. And Tim, I think you're on mute, so. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, loud and okay. clear. Okay, Xin from lovely Da Nang, Vietnam, where it's a nice balmy mid thirties outside, but still very beautiful. Um, I like to set the context about Vietnam's gas sector, uh, which is, of course, of which is often the case in the Southeast Asia region and Asia Pacific region, which is geopolitical. I have some slides, and I'm not going to read these slides, I will just kind of hit um, on the basics of some of these slides. You can read them if you like. But the uh, Vietnam has kind of a twin gas problem. One is depleting offshore gas reserves. Um, and another one is geopolitical. And twice in the last three years, uh, state-run Petro Vietnam and its foreign partners, including the Madrid-based Repsol, has been stopped in its exploration and close to production activities and Vietnam's own UN mandated exclusive economic zone, EEZ, by, uh, by, by China. Uh, what this has done, which is exasperated and, and um, highlighted the gas supply shortage that's about to hit Vietnam. In fact, as far as 2016, the government was, was projecting gas supply shortages by 2020, mostly in the Mekong region, uh, Delta region, which is in the southern part of the country, right below Ho Chi Minh. Um, last year, at the beginning of the year before COVID really kicked in, there were some gas supply shortages in the north of the country. The gas supply shortage has been kicked back a couple of years because of COVID, but Vietnam has a very strong economy still and does, has done a very good job of fighting COVID. So I anticipate some gas supply problems coming back probably beginning next year. And the problem with that is the, um, the, there are anticipated rolling black and, black and brownouts, again, and mostly in the southern part of the country. But it goes back to geopolitical. If Vietnam could develop its own natural gas and hydrocarbon resources and its own UN mandated EEZ, would it have a gas supply shortage? Sure. Would it be as acute as it is now? No. Would they still import LNG? Again, yes. But would it be as, as much as they have to now? No, it would not. So not to get too much into geopolitical, but that sets the stage of what's happening in Vietnam, which is similar to what's happening in the Philippines, where I was based for about seven or seven and a half years. So uh, what that has done, is create opportunities for LNG exporters ranging from the US, Australia, 
Qatar, Russia, maybe not Mozambique right now with the problems they've had. So one man's one person's problem is another man's opportunity. So uh, can we go to slide number two? And let's jump into the political, the, the potential structures for LNG to power in Vietnam. And similar to other countries, Vietnam has basically two models for LNG to power. Now, this is later in the slide, but I want to go ahead and preface this. There are as many as 22 LNG to power projects in the new power development plan eight that's going to be released in Vietnam by mid-year. That was supposed to be released in January. It's been kicked down the road a little bit to mid to the mid part of the year because elections have just been, uh, just been held here. But there's two models here um, for developing LNG to power or gas to power projects. The, um, the first one is public-private partnership, PPP. And the, and the second one is under the law of investment, independent power producer, and, and similar to other countries in the region. You know, if a PPP model is used, it's under a build own transfer BOT. The advantage of the PPP model is you will have a concession with the largest electricity, electric company transmitter in Vietnam, which is EVN. Under an IPP, there are no guarantees that you're gonna have a uh, sales purchase agreement or supply agreement. You're an independent power producer. Now that sounds like a lot of problems, but in a few minutes, I'll show you why it may not be a problem. So one company has already kind of worked around that problem. Um, if we look at, if you go further down the slide, the um, power development plan number eight, as I said, has as many as 22 LNG gas to power projects. And, you know, frankly, I, I get calls for the last two years from all over the world, people want to invest in Vietnam and the LNG to power sector. You know, LN, you know, Vietnam's economy is, is the second highest growth economy in the Asia Pacific region for 10 years plus, second only to China. And, you know, and similar to India as well and other countries in the region, to meet that economic growth, you have to have power, you have to have electricity. And what Vietnam is trying to do is increase their gas and their LNG uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, they want to offset coal, which is a problem in the Asia Pacific region, which historically relies on dirty or burning coal. Um, and number two, Vietnam wants to increase the LNG and gas import. Frankly, some of that is geopolitical and not to step on any toes if you're from a, a country where, where you know, there's some problems, but this is what I hear. You know, U.S. projects and U.S. LNG is very much wanted in Vietnam to help keep shipping lanes in the South China Sea open, right? So if LNG cargoes are coming from, from the U.S., well, it helps Vietnam in its geopolitical quandary with Beijing to help fight back incursion on the South China Sea. So um, if we can go back a, further, a little bit further up in the slide, there we go. Uh, gas, there it is, gas to... Yeah, gas to power for 21 to 2030. Let's take a look at that. Uh, power sources utilizing gas will be developed from about seven gigawatts as of last year to 13.5 gigawatts by mid-decade, only three and a half years from now. And as much as 28 to 33 gigawatts in 2030 to be the first year of the next decade. So Vietnam is ramping up gas and gas to power development. Uh, the ratio of gas to power sources will be increased from 15% as of last year to 21 to 23% in 2030. Now, also, as we talk about gas, Vietnam is also doing a pretty good job with renewables, solar recently, offshore wind starting to take off. But the gorilla in the room is not ge just geopolitical, it is still an over-reliance on dirty or burning coal, um, which is the case in, in many Southeast Asian countries. If you look down at the bottom of the slide, this is two years old. It's changed a bit, but renewables, diesel oil, oil um, and so forth is 7% of the energy mix. I think it's 10% now. Gas, 21%. Coal, 34%. That coal actually could increase because Vietnam does have more coal fire power plants in the works. Um, over the next 15 years, that will be developed, which is a, a problem for them meeting their um, climate change goals or, and agendas. Hydro is still pretty strong at 
and this is getting off base, but I have to say this. A lot of times I get a call from people in the EU or even my country in the US and say, why is it Vietnam or the Philippines or Sri Lanka or Bangladesh building out green hydrogen? And I say, you know, that's an unfair question. <laughs> the, the, the goal here in this region is to pivot away from coal first with gas and gas produces 50% less carbon emissions for, when used for power generation than coal. Green hydrogen, which is being really rapidly developed in Europe, is still down the road a bit for Southeast Asia. And there's a couple of reasons. Number one, there's, there's nowhere near cost fuel, you know, fossil fuel cost parity with green hydrogen is still not there. Some say it's a year, some say it's 10 years. So the economies at scale aren't there. But I think the region gets a little bit of a bad rap in the US and Europe for not going green hydrogen. And I say, you know, there's not an equal comparison between EU members or the US and some of these other countries who are developing countries. So, you know, I like to throw that out there because I get a lot of calls about this. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Now, kind of the crust of what I wanted to talk about, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time here. Um, there's a lot of legal and regulatory challenges for Vietnam's LNG and LNG to power sector build out. And if you look, Resolution 55, and this I will read, to help attract to, to track needed FDI, and Vietnam needs FDI in its energy sector. Uh, last year, the Pollock Bureau in Hanoi issued Resolution 55. And some of the things it does, I won't read all of it, but underline, it gives diverse forms of ownership and business models. We just talked about um, PPP, IPP. It prioritizes the development of gas to power projects, and it also uh, addresses importing fuels for power projects. And also calls for the development of energy infrastructure to import 8 billion cubic meters of LNG in 2030 and about 15 billion by 2045. Um, how am I doing on time here? Can... I have about a minute, Tim. About a minute, I'm about 20% through. Okay, <laughs> so I'll wrap up this. I'll wrap up this slide. The biggest hurdle in Vietnam, other than being geopolitical and develop its own oil and gas reserves, mostly gas in the South China Sea, Vietnam needs to develop a more established uh, legal and regulatory framework for LNG and LNG to power. In the past and going forward, a lot of that is done by prime ministerial decree and people's committees on the provincial level. Nonetheless, Vietnam does have older laws on investment that are still attractive to bring in much needed FDI. But two big problems for Vietnam, geopolitical, and they do need to develop an LNG, an LNG leg legal and regulatory framework. Um, so basically, yeah. Yeah. later, if you have any questions, there's other things I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't cover. We can go into that a little bit later. So thank you very much. Thanks, Tim, um, for those insightful comments. I think, um, as you've shown, we can really talk about these uh, issues all day. Um, so again, just want to remind everyone, if you do have questions, we will be addressing them um, at the end of the uh, all the panelists' presentations. So please uh, drop them in the chat or Q&A boxes at the bottom of your screen there. Um, so we will now go to our next uh, panelist, um, Mr. Mola Amzad Hossein, who's the editor of Energy and Power magazine in Bangladesh. So Mr. Mola has been working in uh, Bangladesh's media sector since 1982. And over his uh, long experience in journalism, which has spanned over 38 years, he has been publishing and editing the country's first and only energy sector magazine, um, Energy and Power, which was first uh, started being published in 2003. Prior to bringing out his own publication, he also worked with various newspapers within Bangladesh. Mr. Mola developed his expertise on the energy sector, having um, initially reported over diverse fields like trade and business, environment, politics, and aviation. He has covered many international and regional events on energy, trade, and business, and he's attended various international conferences and meetings as a resource and a panelist, and also in some cases presented papers on the energy sector. Mr. Mola often takes part in TV talk shows as an energy and environment analyst, and his special interests are in the fields of media, communication, energy, environment, IT, travel, reading, and community development. While he was an undergraduate student at the University of Rajshahi in Bangladesh, Mr. Mola was actively involved in student politics as well as social and cultural activities. 
He received his master's in Bengali literature from the University of Rajshahi. So Mr. Mola, I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Tanvi, for your kind word uh, regarding me. Uh, actually, my presentation, um, uh, I try to share my presentation first. Just a moment. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, uh, and very good morning. Um, uh, all of you, uh, uh, thank you for organizing to, uh, to inviting me. Actually, my presentation is a bit long, but I touch just a few uh, um, uh, slide uh, uh, over my talks. Uh, actually, just uh, a decade back, Bangladesh completely depends on its own energy resources, especially the gas and Bangladesh economy and power generation completely depend on own natural gas. But right now, Bangladesh running shortage of natural gas uh, compared to Asia and other countries and world, we have uh, very small reserve. Uh, we have uh, only uh, only 10 TC of a preserve remaining. Um, and if we're not able to find new gas, then our all gas is exhausted by 2031. So uh, right now, last two years, Bangladesh uh, 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 introduced to exporting LNG to fulfill the local demand, gas demand. Our gas demand right now, 3,500 million cubic feet a day and almost 60% uh, of uh, them uh, goes for the power generation both the grid and captive and uh, you know due to uh, due to some uh, political indecision uh, we have to fail to explore our own gas in last 20 uh, years uh, you, you know um, uh, our gas consumption pattern uh, just uh, our gas uh, consumption scenario here, uh, you can have a look. Um, in our overall gas consumption is mainly in the grid power generation, 44% is go to the grid power generation and captive 15% uh, and, and, and other 40% used by other sectors, industry, business, um, you know, we have uh, do, do domestic pipe uses gas. Uh, but uh, major problem in Bangladesh, uh, you, you know, major problem in Bangladesh uh, is uh, uh, we are existing, our gas, uh, 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 existing gas resource is alarmingly very low. So we're trying to, we're trying to uh, enhance the gas import facilities, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, as well as the exploring own gas. As per the USGS uh, Petro Bangla study, we have more of uh, 20 to 30 TCF gas, but it is uh, unexplored, uh, shore and uh, onshore and offshore both. So uh, uh, we have offshore exploration in 1974, uh, but 80s, we have onshore exploration, onshore PSC. We have uh, uh, 1993, we have uh, onshore. PSC 1997, we have onshore PSC, and 2008 uh, onward, we have offshore PSC, but still uh, uh, after 2000, we don't have any major discovery. Uh, the, our major discovery is BBNA gas fill by uh, the US company, uh, you know, call, and now it's uh, uh, um, operated by another US company, Chevron. Uh, so uh, the, now that is uh, due to COVID, we are trying to some finding some information uh, from our uh, shore for the next exploration. But due to COVID, the total exploration activities is uh, stopped right now. And you know, uh, the uh, Bangladesh have some future exploration uh, plan. Uh, you, you know, Bangladesh have one uh, national company. It's named Bapex. BAPEX tried to do some work with the Russian uh, company Gazprom and as well as they try to 
uh, uh, try to cite some JB for exploration in the uh, Chittagong Hill tracks and government preparing themselves to go for the uh, offshore exploration. But you know, compare, uh, right now our total uh, power generation, if you uh, go to the energy mix, our total power generation almost 60% came from the natural gas and LNG. Uh, and uh, almost 30% uh, uh, we use uh, costly liquid fuel, diesel and furnace oil, it's uh, 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 imported. Uh, so uh, uh, government put uh, uh, fuel mix basket coal, but now coal contribution is very less, but we have uh, under pressure by the development partner, development countries, as well as the financial organization to getting new finance for the coal power plant. Uh, so uh, now our uh, plan to generate at least 35% power from uh, the uh, natural gas and LNG, 35% uh, from coal, uh, but maybe the, our next plan, uh, this will be uh, changed. You, you know, Bangladesh have one less uh, lost opportunities. Uh, you all know about the Tri-Nation Pipeline and Bangladesh tried to Oh, India tried to buy uh, Myanmar gas uh, through Bangladesh. The one Bangladeshi company, uh, Mohona Holdings, they uh, formulated this proposal, but due to political uh, region, the then Bangladesh government doesn't allow India to uh, buy uh, Myanmar gas through Bangladesh. So it's a uh, miss opportunities for Bangladesh. If uh, we able to do that pipeline, uh, then Bangladesh can take their gas from this pipeline uh, uh, from Myanmar. But uh, Bangladesh now try to uh, uh, set up a link with the Myanmar to import their gas. But Myanmar always says they don't have any excess gas to sell. And uh, our earlier presenter mentioned uh, Myanmar uh, produced a lot of gas, but uh, some of the gas uh, export in Thailand and some in China. Uh, so, uh, the, just a few years back, uh, one discussion uh, uh, was started with uh, India uh, to uh, uh, import gas uh, through pipeline from the uh, imported LNG from India, but it is not work still. Uh, uh, but uh, Bangladesh uh, uh, still uh, uh, focus on the international uh, arena, so especially, you know, the South Asian region, this part of uh, the Asia, the energy hungry India, Bangladesh, uh, um, Bhutan have uh, uh, enough energy, they are hydro resource. Nepal have uh, many hydro resources but unexplored, so they have a running shortage of energy. Sri Lanka running shortage of industry, energy, Pakistan, uh, uh, India, Bangladesh, all the countries running shortage of industry. So uh, linkages between Asia and South Asia is a good source of energy, especially getting gas. And you know, the civil society and activists are very active in, in this region, uh, anti-fossil fuel campaign. But uh, in, uh, in the footing in that renewable energy, Bangladesh achievement is very low. Now, uh, our present capacity of power generation for renewable energy, uh, little higher than 3%. Though government target is achieving 10% by 2021. Uh, but uh, uh, right now our challenge uh, to build uh, uh, infrastructure for importing energy, especially gas. Uh, you know, Bangladesh already have two FSRU. Uh, two FSRU is operational uh, for gas sector FSRU. Uh, the FSRU capacity is around one, uh, 1,000 uh, million cubic feet a day. Uh, and government plan to in, in establish another land-based LNG terminal in Matarbari. And another LNG terminal, they actually on discussion with the, another American company, Accelerate, uh, in the Paira region. It's a, a diff using different technology, not in land, in deep offshore. Uh, so uh, the future of Bangladesh uh, is depending on uh, importing energy, uh, our energy basket plan is uh, completely dependent on importing energy. So cooperation uh, between uh, SARC and beam state country for uh, uh, importing energy, especially gas and electricity 
the future for Bangladesh. Thank you so much for patient hearing. Thank you, Mr. Mala, for the very insightful presentation. Uh, we'll move on to our final panelist for today, um, Twesh Mishra, who is the principal co correspondent for the Business Standard in India. Twesh is a journalist who writes on energy and infrastructure from New Delhi, where he focuses on Indian government policies. He has been a full-time journalist since 2014 and is keenly tracking India's energy transition while working across magazines, television, online, and print media. He is presently working at the Business Standard newspaper where he focuses on oil and gas and the Indian railways. He has been felicitated as a World Wildlife Fund India Young Climate Media Fellow and as a grant awardee by the Clean Energy Wire Network in Germany. So with that, Twesh, I will hand it over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I hope I'm audible. Um, so I'll try and center my presentation more about how India's natural gas experience has been till now. And um, um, I'll try and give less numbers, but more perspective. So um, this is a slide from Shell A, Shell, Royal Dutch Shell's uh, recent um, LNG outlook. Um, they are saying that uh, even though India's domestic gas production uh, and LNG imports, um, there has been an increase in the Indian imports of LNG, but this was primarily driven because of two things. One, the prices of uh, LNG remain softer and uh, domestic demand, uh, if, it, if, it, if it did not increase, it, it remained at the same levels, but domestic production fell. So India had to import uh, liquefied natural gas to meet these demands. Um, but um, the next slide, uh, if you look at what KPMG said in 2017, um, the growth, uh, the growth of the of the LNG in the in the entire world is going to be driven mostly by India and China. So uh, these are going to be the large drivers of demand. And uh, it was said that from 2020 to 2025. Um, we are going to anticipate uh, anticipate a surge in demand for LNG, but that requires a lot of investment in infrastructure. Now, um, if you see what happened in India was that there was a lot of promise of uh, domestic natural gas production coming on stream. And some of it was made back in 2002 when Reliance Industries promised that 14 trillion cubic feet uh, gas has been discovered by them. And uh, sometime later, GSPC promised that they have found some 20 trillion cubic feet of gas, but none of this really came online. And um, in anticipation of so much domestic gas coming in, um, a lot of power plants came up. So this led to some 14,000 megawatts of standard gas-based power plants. Now, this is where the opportunity is for um, LNG operators. Uh, that if you manage to sell gas, which is cheap enough to uh, run these power plants and the, 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 the other industry that had developed based on the potential for domestic gas, um, that is something that really can be explored by everybody who is interested in the Indian market. Now, um, the, the broad opportunity in India is uh, trying to serve the unmet consumers. Um, this is a very small fraction because uh, almost 95% of our country is connected with uh, the liquefied petroleum gas or LPG or what we call cooking gas connections. So pretty much everybody has access to hydrocarbons, but converting these LPG consumers to pipe natural gas, um, that is where there is a premium and that is where there's also an opportunity. Uh, the other opportunity for natural gas in India is for car owners who are looking for a cheaper fuel because the government continues to tax uh, petrol and diesel, which is uh, motor spirit and high speed diesel very heavily. So, but they don't tax natural gas as heavily. So for any car owner who's looking for cheaper fuel, natural gas is an alternative. And this is also an opportunity where um, an LNG player or an importer would like to tap the market. Further, there are also many smaller industries who keep looking for alternative fuels that are cleaner because there is enough pressure being building up to uh, stop using pet coke or uh, uh, for now. So um, that is also an opportunity. Now, there are a lot of challenges as well in India, and uh, this includes policy flip-flops, which have 
delayed domestic production and uh, it has also led to a sort of a price regulation on the entire market so uh, now gas in india especially domestic gas in india is available at less than 2 dollars per million british thermal units and at a price this low lng cannot compete so they really need to find a balance um, where the domestic production grows but it does not hurt the consumers now um, there are there's also a lot of politicization of the businesses and uh, sometime in 2014 there were allegations of the gas price being manipulated to favor a few companies um so the the the, the issue was that if you hike the price and allow a company to make money uh, and grow a market you might end up uh, going out of power so no politician wanted to face that and that is why there is so much price control over uh, energy pricing in india uh, there have also been major delays in project completion pipelines take years years more than they had and they project uh, to 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 really finish so that is something which is really troubling in the indian market and um, it it is a challenge that all players who are interested here need to be aware of uh, there's also a lot of price sensitivity of consumers uh, so one of the reasons why uh, there was so much spurt in lng imports in india recently was because the price of lng had crashed but the moment the price started climbing up again you would see that the orders for lng would have also come down so the indian consumer is really price sensitive because the per capita income is not very favorable so um, whichever company wants to come and participate here they need to be ready to give it cheap cheap enough to outdo coal and also uh, given a short supply so that the industries that do come up uh, on the base of these projections manage to thrive and uh, i'll close my presentation now thank you thank you tosh for your presentation <clears throat> excuse me so that concludes all of our presentations from our panelists today and we will move uh, into the Q&A uh, question and answer session. So again, a reminder, if you have any questions, please drop them into the Q&A or chat uh, functions at the bottom of your screen. Um, I will kick us off maybe with a question today. Um, I know we've talked a lot about the opportunities um, for natural gas throughout the region in both South and Southeast Asia. So I'm curious what our panelists think about um, the role that natural gas will play moving forward into the future as these countries adopt more renewable um, sources of energy into their energy mix. Um, so maybe, I don't know if we wanna just go in the order the panelists uh, spoke, but Amanda, I uh, would definitely love to hear your thoughts on, on that question. Thank you, Tanvi. Um, I believe that gas will still play a considerable part, a considerable role in the primary energy mix of most Southeast Asian and South Asian nations going forward. It's still viewed very much as a clean fuel compared to coal. And if you take somewhere like Indonesia, which has got one of the most energy demand, highest, sorry, highest energy demand growth in, within ASEAN, you don't have to look back far to see at the end of the last century, coal only accounted for approximately 10% of um, fuel used in the country. As energy demand increased by sort of around 2015, 2016, coal was actually accounting for around 30%, almost close to a third. And that is becoming unsustainable. So yes, gas will come along. Gas will play a huge part, whether it is just for the energy transition or whether that is seen as a sort of real complement to be hand in hand with future renewables projects remains to be seen. It's also worth looking at as well at what nations within the region, what renewables um, energy sources they actually have. The Philippines has a lot of geothermal, Indonesia has geothermal projects already ongoing. Other nations such as the north of Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, they have hydropower and they're already using that renewables to export electricity across borders. But to answer your question succinctly, yes, I think gas has very much a future. 
the region of Asia last year, its LNG demand went up by 6 million tonnes per annum, according to Wood Mackenzie analysts. So even in a COVID year, the demand growth for liquefied natural gas, driven mainly by China and India, was actually higher last year than it was in pre-pandemic 2019. So all the signs are good for gas. Thank you, Amanda. Um, Tim, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I have some thoughts here. I'm not sure if you see my video, but I, uh, I think if you juxtapose, and I hit on this a few minutes ago, Southeast and South Asia with the EU and the U.S. is not really a fair juxtaposition as far as uh, green hydrogen, blue hydrogen. In, in North Asia and Japan, South Korea, and down in Australia, they're doing a pretty remarkable job of already developing green hydrogen infrastructure build out. Japan, similar to what they did with LNG and even oil 20 and 30 years ago, developing a worldwide green hydrogen value chain and kudos to them. But Japan, still, North Asia, I think North Asia LNG demand will flatten. I think going forward, LNG demand uptick will be South, Southeast Asia, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, the Philippines, Vietnam, of course, India, um, India as well. So I guess to answer your question, I, I see LNG in Asia not as a transitionary fuel as, as perhaps in the West. I do think the region will continue to ramp up solar and wind. And now I'm, I'm excluding China from, from talking about this because that's a different dynamic. I think LNG is here to stay in Southeast Asia at least to mid-century. And that sounds a little bit bizarre, but not really when it's 2021. And after that, it will still be used um, per, per, perhaps as a transitionary fuel after I think the mid part of the, of the, um, of the century. But again, you know, the, the quandary for Southeast Asia, for the most part, is to get away from, from dirty or burning coal. And once you do that, you use, you know, solar power, gas, then you start talking about blue and green hydrogen. And maybe by then, end of the decade, um, hydrogen and fossil fuel cost parity will come along. But gas in Asia is, is here to stay, my opinion. Thanks, Tim. Um, Marla, do you have any thoughts on this question. Hello, Bob. I, I believe uh, the last uh, 30 years for the Asia uh, uh, fuel choice is the gas, especially if we look into my country, Bangladesh. Uh, uh, our energy basket planning is uh, still uh, depends on gas. So gas domination in uh, uh, the Bangladesh as well as the most of the South Asia, South uh, uh, Asian and Asian country will be uh, will be major gas will be the major fuel for the Asia next at least next uh, 25 years or 30 years and for Bangladesh at least 30 years gas is the major fuel uh, renewable energy uh, contribution in Bangladesh is it's a bit slow but uh, we have some significant achievement from uh, efficient use of energy especially right now. Uh, you know, B B Bangladesh uh, power generation based on gas. Our generation efficiency was 29%, but uh, last 10 years it in enhanced, now it is around 40%. And government have planned to increase it in 50%. So gas will be our pool of choice, I think, this year too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then over to you, Twash. Uh, hi. Uh, I feel um, coal will remain the primary energy driver for India. As far as gas is concerned, gas might act as a spinning reserve or uh, a way to, to supplement renewable energy. Um, that is the kind of strategy that India is taking because for India, LNG is too expensive. And um, at this point, they really don't want to burden the consumers with more expensive power. So um, if you're looking for a very large increase in consumption, that's not going to happen. There will be a gradual increase, but um, power will primarily continue to be driven by coal. Um, as far as, I, I, and I'll just try and give a perspective of um, how much gas we have. Um, so uh, around 90% of India's domestic gas production is another administered price mechanism. 
which has now put the price of domestic reproduced gas below two dollars, and um, of that, twenty five percent goes to the city gas distribution segment. So. As India increases its city gas distribution networks, which means it tries to provide uh, pipe natural gas connections to people in their households, or uh, it increases compressed natural gas run cars, there might be an increase in the demand for natural gas. But at this point, most of that will come from the domestically produced gas. Uh, LNG might not be used to cook uh, food in India anytime soon. LNG, if it will be used, it will most probably be used for running power plants or for industries or for maybe trucks, but uh, a very large scale commercialization of uh, LNG is not going to happen. We will see a lot more coal in the energy mix, but uh, if LNG has to grow, it has to grow in complementarity with renewable energy. Okay, thanks, Tvash. Um, So with that, maybe I will uh, address some of the questions that have come up from our participants today. Um, so I've just opened the question answer um, box here. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them here in the chat box. Um, so our first question, I believe, came up during uh, Mr. Mala's presentation. Um, the question is, what are the challenges such as completing pipeline and FSRU at the same time mooring ship to ship transfer up during bad weather conditions, et cetera, that you faced in introducing an FSRU in Bangladesh, I'm assuming. Uh, uh, thank you, Bob. Actually, it's a, it's a major problem. And a study shown almost uh, 90 days, we will not able to operate uh, the FSRU. And uh, we face those problem in the bad day, especially the, uh, when uh, Bay of Bengal uh, was rough, uh, then we will not able to operate uh, our uh, FSRU. Uh, so uh, we uh, experienced gas shortage that time. Um, so it is a big problem uh, compared to the pipeline. Pipeline supply is secure and more dependable, but FSRU is not. That's why Bangladesh go for the land-based LNG terminal to secure uh, the steady gas supply. Thanks, Mr. Mala. Um, I think just going to another question here, of course, a compliment here um, on how informative all the presentations were. So thanks everyone again. Um, and then this is another question for you, Mr. Mala. With so many LNG terminals coming up in India and India being surplus by 2024 in all likelihood, can Bangladesh look for an early cross-border pipeline link with India? Uh, yes, uh, but I mentioned my presentation, you know, Bob, some Indian company, they uh, offer Bangladesh to sell uh, 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 liquefied uh, natural gas from their imported LNG. Uh, but, uh, but two, three years negotiation, uh, uh, those proposal was not work. So still there is no hope to importing liquefied natural gas from uh, uh, importing liquefied natural gas through pipeline from India. Right now, uh, our, our government have also suspended their, this, those plan and two proposals still laying with the Bangladesh government. So it is not a, a very attractive proposal for Bangladesh. Could I just say something, please? Just one topic that's been mentioned slightly, but obviously underpins a lot of decision-making with gas projects LNG pipeline projects within the whole Asia region is how much financial support host governments are able to offer. Do they invest in the infrastructure, whether it's a private partnership alongside the host government? Are there fiscal or other incentives? And, you know, or, or subsidies for the fuel itself? I think we should see a lot more discussion perhaps for another day on what perhaps incentive host governments are able to offer to help with the um, build-up of infrastructure and for renewables as well. Thanks, Amanda. Um, this next question that we have is for all the panelists, I think, so feel free to, to jump in your responses. 
So with LNG expected to play a significant role, can we assume the governments would do more to incentivize investors for LNG infrastructure development? If so, what are the possible incentives? Well, I think, I think that depends on a case by case, country by country basis. It's kind of hard to answer um, in, in general. Um, you know, Vietnam is where I'm at now is making it more attractive for LNG uh, players to export LNG and also to the and gas or LNG to power projects. And there's various incentives that are, are being put forth in proposals and so on. But I think that's, you know, this depends on a country by country basis. Another issue, of course, when it comes to LNG imports is whether host gov specific host governments um, allow third party importers or not. Singapore has issued licenses to an initial two companies, then just recently followed up with another two players that are allowed to import and market and distribute that um, regasified volumes within Singapore. Thailand for a long time kept it to within its own essentially state-owned PTT, but it's slowly up, opening up to third-party players to come in and share the spoils. The Philippines appears to be open, whether it's um, to international players, domestic players. So a lot of it comes down to the control, but the LNG imports are one thing. It's a question also of who is prepared to finance or what incentives they might offer then for the necessary distri gas distribution if new pipelines need to be involved? Who pays uh, for them? Can I add, can I add, Anbe? Uh, in Bangladesh government formally to one policy to allow private sector uh, to import LNG and sell uh, inside Bangladesh. But there is a problem, our gas, uh, price is regulated. This price is regulated by the government through BRC. So uh, importing uh, LNG, uh, follow that policy through private sector of Bangladesh and marketing uh, in the market price in Bangladesh, it is very difficult. Uh, so without, without a special package of incentive by the government, uh, there will be uh, no scope for the private sector to importing LNG and market alone. Thank you. Uh, hi, may I add something from India about this? Uh, I don't think uh, we can expect the Indian government to go out of their way and incentivize uh, LNG because it's not a primary fuel for us. Um, for us, uh, we would rather use coal for longer. Um, so we might see LNG for uh, any specific industry, but uh, the Indian government would rather say, you come at a market price, uh, it's totally up to you how you afford it. Nice to see some participation from the government also over here. Uh, thanks. Great, thanks everyone. Um, this next, oh, sorry, go ahead, Amanda. Right, just very briefly touching on, as Mullah Amsad said as well, is that the gas price in Bangladesh, as in some other nations, if the gas price is fixed and or there's a requirement to sell a certain percentage of your gas to the host government or state agencies at a fixed price, that actually has a knock-on effect on how attractive your exploration acreage is. Um, I believe that the gas pricing issue was why Bangladesh hasn't had very high take up in some of its offshore licensing rounds, is that the risks are just seen as too high, that even if you make a large gas discovery, is it gonna be commercial 10, 15, 20 years down the line? Yeah, but uh, Bob, I add one thing in, in our PSC, uh, the cost of gas, price of gas is very attractive uh, right now. But, uh, but two, three years back, it was not attractive like that. Uh, but uh, in the market is assured in Bangladesh, if anyone find gas, even it is a 10 TCA, there is a guaranteed market and Petro Bangla can buy uh, all the gas as contracted price. There is no problem. There is no marketing problem in Bangladesh. So, uh, but there is a problem 
laying with the activists, uh, left-oriented politicians. They are always uh, believe uh, the, any uh, if government allow IOCs to explore Bangladeshi gas, the uh, they uh, uh, actually sell out the Bangladesh interest to the foreign company. It's not true. It's already uh, decided in Bangladesh earlier. Still, our uh, producing gas uh, almost 50% producing by IOCs and a total discovered gas 95% discovered by the IOCs too. So uh, there is a there is a political debate, uh, but now the package for uh, ex exploring gas is attractive for PSC especially an option. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Um, so this next question, maybe we'll start off with Twesh since it is about India, but definitely want to hear from all the panelists. Um, what ab about hydrogen's future in India as advanced countries are moving towards hydrogen? Uh, so the Indian government has uh, started working on hydrogen fuel, but they started from the year 2000 and uh, uh, Indian oil, um, the largest fuel retailer in the country has also developed uh, clean hydrogen manufacturing technology as well. Uh, uh, th there's a new association for hydrogen that has come up, which is led by Reliance and I think a US company as well. So um, there, is, there is growth, but uh, I think it's too early to say that it will be able to displace any of the major fuels that we are using right now. So I don't see any anything very, very significant happening over the next 10 years. Thanks, Twesh. Uh, any thoughts from anyone else on the panel? All right, um, we can move then to the next question. So um, I see here there is a question on the Philippines. I know, Tim, you had a um, great exchange on, on that. So definitely encourage you all to read that in the answered section of the questions if you'd like to learn more on, on opportunities in the Philippines. Um, the next question is, uh, can you discuss how projects are financed in countries where offtake volumes and government guarantees are limited? Thinking mainly about IPPs in Vietnam and the Philippines, how can you underpin projects without large long-term offtake opportunities? That's a good question here in the Philippines. Um, you know, I, um, I tell commercial players when they ask me, you know, should they come in as a PPP or IPP? And of course I say PPP, because, you know, if you come in as an independent power producer, you have no guarantee because you're an independent power producer selling your gas um, pretty much at the whim of, of, of the buyer. But Delta Offshore Energy is building a four gigawatt gas to power plant in the southern, almost at southern Philippines, in southern Vietnam, in the Mekong Delta area. And they have recently inked a 25-year deal to uh, already sell their gas and they're an IPP. But it's a good question in Vietnam, because if you come in under an IPP model, you have uh, no guarantees that you're going to have a, a buyer for your gas. You're at disadvantage over a PPP. And you're also going to have more trouble, you can, do, you can do it quicker, you build out quicker, but you're gonna have a lot more trouble also getting financing and getting um, investors on board, at least here in Vietnam. Thanks, Tim. Um, next question here is for Twesh and Mola, but again, um, the other panelists feel free to Join in as well. What effect will climate policy slash urgency have on gas in South Asia? Uh, should I should I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I believe that as long as um, gas projects supplement the renewable energy projects, uh, their uh, their relevance will keep growing. But uh, if, if people try to push standalone gas project, especially for power generation to try and displace coal, that will be very difficult. Um, 
because uh, the Indian consumer is very price sensitive. At twelve dollars per MBTU, they cannot afford power generation at all. So, um, even like if if hypothetically speaking, gas is available for say six dollars landed price per MBTU, then it might be competitive. But at uh, and and I I don't think that's that's possible in India right now. So, um, if if it is working as uh, as a way to generate power when the solar part when the solar project is not generating power or when there when when there is a sudden outage of wind energy then you suddenly ramp up gas gas based power generation then it makes sense but uh, not 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 to not to completely displace dirty energy so to say Thanks, Twesh. Any uh, thoughts from you, Mr. Mala, in, in Bangladesh? Uh, you know, our uh, very recent must talk to issue government, uh, you know, I mentioned my presentation, government now planning to reduce uh, their uh, uh, some planned coal-based power plant due to a constraint of financing. So some uh, research community, research group, and some uh, green group, they uh, put their demand uh, to replace this uh, power generation capacity through renewables. But reality is if a uh, landed cost of gas, LNG is uh, $9 per MMBTU, still the gas base, LNG based power generation is cheaper than renewable. You know, Bangladesh has only one source and it's solar. And if we go for actually 24 seven solar, then we go for the storage. It's still, it is very, very costly and it's very new for Bangladesh. So by replacing a gas through renewables still for Bangladesh, it is not viable, I think. All right, thank you both. Um, moving to the chat now, um, our next question that we received via email was, um, what else can we do for sustainable development in this sector? What kind of infrastructure development uh, do you think we need? So I think this is open really to all the panelists. So welcome your thoughts on this question. Um, okay, uh, that's a little bit of a, a general question. I'm not... Um, Really sure how to answer that. Um, just can can you repeat it, and I'll frame my thoughts. But it's a little bit vague. Yeah, sure. Um, and if uh, whoever asks this question, feel free to. If there's specific countries or, or anything you're interested in, please feel free to elaborate in the chat box. The question is: What else can we do for sustainable development in the sector? What kind of infrastructure development is needed? I, I suppose by sustainability, they're talking about uh, climate uh, change concerns. Is... Yes, I would imagine so. Okay. I have not I'll, jumped, jumped I'll, in the I'll, chat I'll, yet, I'll, but yes. Okay, okay. I, I, I think um, the LNG sector in Southeast Asia and South Asia will uh, eventually come along and do what's already being done in the EU which to, you will have to make the, um, the whole gas and LNG value chain more environmentally friendly. For example, you know, when you're producing, the producers of LNG, which will be in Qatar, US, nonetheless, a part of the value chain, they're gonna to have to do carbon capture storage. You know, when they're due production, instead of using, you know, uh, gas or, or fossil fuel for, for production, they can use renewables. So I think across the whole entire value chain, the movement is happening um, in Europe, but mostly in the U.S., because Europe doesn't really produce any LNG, will also trickle down to to um, to Asia. I think it will come top down from Japan, which is already pretty innovated, and South Korea come up from the bottom from from Australia, and kind of sandwich in between. But I think as far as sustainability, the rest of the world and the LNG production players will bring that forward for the region. Um, I think there will be political pressure there. And I think even in the region in time, as it is in the West, in the EU, there will be financing 
pressure to be more sustainable. Uh, CCS and you know everything else across the board. I think Shell kind of got caught. You know, I hate to say with their pants down, but they did. Where they were trying to offset, off, you know, offset some of their um, emissions by so-called planting more trees. The offset game, and you know, it's not really the best way to go. CCS is the best way to go. Um, you know, when you produce gas, produce it, produce LNG. You do it with renewables, hydrogen if you can, solar if you can, renew, you know, wind if you can. But I think it's going to be a trickle down effect to to the Asia Pacific region, other than Japan, which which is is North Asia, of course. Hi. Um, yes, I I concur with what Tim's just said. CCS or CCUS, the underground or undersea components or you for utilization, depending on your choice of what the U stands for, is gonna become increasing both for LNG projects, um, BP's Tangu project in Indonesia. They're adding a third train as part of the next expansion phase, like possibly a fourth train, but billions of dollars being invested. Um, and there will be a CCS project linked to that too. CCS is also being used to develop sour gas fields in Indonesia from scratch, a couple in Malaysia, because they're aware of just how polluting, especially the sour gas fields can be. And there is a drive. I saw a report only last week from Wood Mackenzie, just saying how the demand is coming from Asian LNG buyers for greener cargoes. Now, some perhaps are more green than others, you know, some is just purely offsetting. Singapore's Pavilion Energy now wants um, its most recent deals, wants an emissions sort of tracking thing. So from wellhead to arrival in Singapore, the green sort of footprint, the carbon footprint of that LNG cargo is something that can be looked at, reduced, but offsetting is, the, is probably the worst bit. The message seems to be from the big oil companies and by default gas companies and operators is reduce where possible, sequester, and if all else fails, then, then you offset. Well, I, I think as far as, you know, they're going to have to because the, the financing dynamics in, in Europe and now under President Biden, the US will dictate this, they won't have a choice. And as you said, this is going to start happening in the Asia Pacific region, which is good news for the LNG and gas industry. Um, you know, people think it's already a dinosaur. You know, it's not so long ago that LNG was was the bright guy on the on the spot after Fukushima and everybody was anti-nuclear. And here we are only 10 years past Fukushima and LNG is getting a little bit of bad press. So, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll step up to the plate. Great, thank you both. Um, and I see a follow-up question just came up in the chat as well. What is the position of South Asian countries on uh, CCUS, so carbon capture and storage, um, particularly in India? So any thoughts from Twesh or Mola on that? Oh, in a, 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 you know, but still, uh, um, uh, so far, my information, uh, there is no work started in India to, to uh, carbon capture and storage. And Bangladesh, there is no scope to do uh, a project like this. And uh, in the connection of sustainability, uh, affordable energy supply is one prior condition for sustainable uh, uh, energy supply. Uh, uh, we, can, we can take a lot of project uh, to grow green or net zero in the targeting net zero. But uh, if uh, we invested more and more uh, to enhance the, uh, enhance the less, uh, enhance the uh, green uh, portfolio, so uh, energy will be uh, very costly and that will be not affordable for the local people. So it's the big challenge for uh, the Asian country, especially the South Asian country, country like Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Bhutan, both, all this country, the same problem. But uh, there is uh, no uh, thinking uh, on the carbon capture and storage in Bangladesh. 
uh, I, I think I agree with uh, Sir uh, what he just said um, because I don't think I have come across much talk about carbon capture. Uh, there might be some policy level discussions, but uh, it hasn't really gathered enough momentum to become a mainstream discussion yet. Great, thank you both. Um, the next question is, do you consider gas-based thermal power projects clean? Why that should they be considered for the future if there are options for solar, wind, um, coupled with storage? Can I start? Uh, so. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, Mr. Mala. Yeah, um, uh, I answered this uh, question, uh, focus on my country. You know, uh, right now, uh, uh, our, uh, you, first of all, you know, Bangladesh has one success story, solar home system. We have 5.2 million solar home system. It's a non-grid power solution, but if we, uh, consider the big power, if we consider the uh, grid connected solar project, it's really, really costly uh, with, with storage. Without storage, it's uh, good. It's cost uh, around um, 12 cents or 13 cents, but still imported LNG based power generation uh, is uh, less costly. Some people say uh, there is uh, another cost for the environment. Yes, Bangladesh already uh, the signatory of Paris Convention, Paris Agreement, and uh, we uh, straight, uh, we uh, firmly focused on NDC uh, that we uh, reduce carbon five percent uh, up to five percent with our own investment, and another ten percent uh, we do if we got. Uh, financial support from the rich country or those who are really polluting the globe. So for Bangladesh, uh, only uh, consideration to reduce the pollution, uh, to avoid all the uh, gas-based or coal-based or other uh, fossil fuel-based power plant go to solar power plant for uh, uh, mitigate all their power demand. It is not possible. It's uh, still, it is a, uh, Ethiopian idea for Bangladesh, a country like Bangladesh. But there is a there is an intention, there is a good start and good intention by the government. Uh, we are increasing uh, solar generation. Especially recently, we formed a rooftop uh, net metering policy. Uh, through that policy, uh, we uh, Bangladesh government uh, uh, put some uh, support to the textile industry and they are putting solar panel in their rooftop and then using the uh, green power and they also use their green portfolio that can help their uh, enhance their export to the European country. Um, uh, for Ganshyamji who has asked this question, uh, I would like to say that um, for, a, for a country like India, while setting up a new gas-based power plant may not make sense, but if we manage to get cheap gas to run those power plants, which are already there, that are stranded, that might be a good uh, business proposition. And um, I think the government had thought about it. They ran a scheme to auction off cheap gas by pooling it as well. So um, I think the focus in India right now is to run the existing gas-based power projects that are stranded instead of building new power projects. It's more of a how to save the banks that have financed these projects kind of issue. All right, thank you. Um, I see we still have a few questions. Um, so I will try to get to as many of them as I can. Um, but we will also try to answer them after the presentation is over in case we do run out of time. Um, we've seen several questions asking about the recording of this meeting and the presentations. They will be shared via email to participants um, soon after uh, this, this presentation is over today. Um, the next question is, as this was a USAID and USTDA sponsored panel, I was wondering if any of the panelists could elaborate on what kind of support the US government is likely to provide to investors in the region and to governments to increase their investment in LNG infrastructure. Um, so as the USTDA representative here, I'll just note 
that um, you know many of the details of our administration support for overseas oil and gas projects are still being worked out, but um, the approach will be very thoughtful and method methodical. Um, and there is a clear understanding that this sector does support a lot of US exports and jobs as well. So we're definitely considering it very closely as we move forward, but definitely would love to hear from the panelists on their um, thoughts for ways that the US government um, may be best placed to support um, other countries in their um, as they move towards greater energy security and access. I, I don't can't really speak for the US government, but um, <laughs> I, I think you know, just looking at it from a commercial standpoint, when you have IOCs and a whole hodgepodge of countries investing in the region who wants to invest in gas to power and renewables, sell LNG, that FDI is, is what's needed you know, in Vietnam, Philippines, and other countries. They need FDI. Um, you know, I'm not you know, so much of a big proponent of too much government interference, but that's a political question for another day. But I think when you have Western oil companies, Japanese oil companies, you know, Tokyo Gas here in Vietnam and Co-Gas here in Vietnam, and I, I think the Philippines, that is integral to, to getting things up and going. I think it's a commercial question or a commercial answer. I think uh, USAID should strengthen their uh, project uh, for uh, energy cooperation. Actually, earlier they started the cross-border power trade and power cooperation between the South Asian country. And then now they realize uh, if uh, the cooperation uh, started between South Asian and Asian country that can be help in uh, power and energy sector both and mutual interest. So uh, if uh, they can focus more on it uh, to linkage between uh, SARC and Asian country, uh, not only the power as well as the gas and other mineral resources cooperation and enhancing the uh, uh, natural resources for the uh, um, for the uh, both the region uh, interest that could be help to uh, enhance uh, extra uh, uh, enhance attention of uh, the FDI for those country those country those country have unexplored uh, resources like Bangladesh uh, Myanmar and other countries. Great, thank you. Um, I will end with the, the last question here in the uh, question and answer box. Um, but panelists, I do encourage you if you are able to, to type in answers to any um, questions you weren't able to get to. Um, but since we are running short on time, we'll end with this question. Um, so the question is for countries that are still in the process of developing their LNG industry, what policies do you think are necessary to be implemented to ensure the safety and security of the industry's operations? Is that from a operational standpoint, safety and security, or you know, or a um, financial aspect, or it sounds like operational since it says industries operations. Maybe we can give um, the panelists a couple of minutes to, to stew over that one. And uh, please, again, feel free to answer directly in the Q&A box or in the chat. Um, that concludes our Q&A portion of the discussion today. So thanks, everyone. And I will hand it over to Sarah uh, to close us out today. OK, thank you, Tanvi. And yeah, if the um, panelists want you know, to think that question through, if you come up with an answer, we can share it with the rest of the group um, via email later. My apologies for, for no video. I'm having to work off of my phone now due to unstable internet, which I'm sure everyone can relate to. Uh, but I just wanted to take a minute on behalf of the US Agency for International Development and my own organization, the US Energy Association, uh, to thank everyone who took the time to participate in today's webinar. Thank you to Tanvi for moderating and keeping us on time and 
screening the questions during our closing session. And thanks to uh, USEA's Executive Director, Ms. Sheila Hollis, for joining us at such an early hour in the US, just 6 a.m., and for setting the stage for today's conversation. And then most importantly, um, thanks to the speakers, Amanda and Tim and Amzad and Twesh, for sharing your wonderful insights and perspectives from Singapore and Vietnam and Bangladesh and India. It has been a fascinating and engaging discussion. Um, and we're already seeing a lot of positive feedback from the participants. As Tanvi mentioned, we'll be sharing the um, a video copy and the PowerPoints with everyone via email. And um, I just, you know, in closing, I wish everyone a good day or a good night, depending on what part of the world you're in. And we look forward to seeing you at a future US-Asia Gas Partnership webinar. Thank you very much. <laughs>